So, well, um, maybe I'll get started and then I'll pass it off to Fred and we can kind of interchange. Um, alors, la session aujourd'hui va être euh, dans les deux, deux, deux langues euh, bilingues, mais comme tous nos autres euh, ateliers, les diapos sont dans les deux langues, alors bilingues, et euh, vous pouvez poser des questions dans la langue de votre choix. Um, so just to kind of repeat quickly, uh, the session today will be in both languages. Um, and uh, like our last uh, workshops, the slides are also bilingual. So all the information that we're presenting written, you'll be able to see in both official languages. And uh, Fred and I, I'll just kind of pass it back and forth. We'll take questions in either language if you guys have them. Um, yeah. Uh, so I guess to give you a bit of context on this uh, particular uh, workshop. So um, this was actually a suggestion uh, by our uh, grad uh, studies director, uh, Sylvie Grosjean. And she thought that this topic was important because oftentimes when it comes time to writing an abstract, it's something that you're asked to do when you're applying to a conference, or it's something you leave till the last minute when you are writing a paper or doing your thesis. And it actually is a really important document because uh, as we'll show you in a bit, it is kind of the only thing people usually read. Uh, so it's something that doesn't get a lot of attention and we don't spend a lot of time on it, but it is something that actually probably should have at least a little bit of targeted thinking. So that is it. Um, so we will get started. Uh, alors le plan aujourd'hui, c'est qu'on va faire un petit aperçu de, du résumé et les composantes. On va parler un peu de l'objectif du résumé. Um, on va parler de la structure euh, ou le format général ou typique. Euh, ensuite, on va parler un peu de chaque section et les composantes de ce, ces sections. Et ensuite, on va vous parler un peu des erreurs euh, communes qu'on voit souvent dans des résumés. So, um, that's the plan for today. Uh, we'll get right into it. So, uh, an abstract is a, a short paragraph that summarizes the major aspects of either a paper, a study, or a research proposal in a prescribed sequence. Um, so overall, it should cover um, kind of the purpose of the, pro of the work you did or the research you did, and it should clearly state what problem you are trying to address uh, through that work. Um, it should, if it's a research uh, that you're presenting or you're presenting some results, it should cover the basic design of the research, but not in too much detail. Um, it needs to include the kind of major findings as a result of your analysis or, or uh, kind of what you found through whether you're doing like a theoretical review or kind of what the findings are. And then finally, it should include a brief summary of your interpretations and uh, conclusions. So um, that is kind of the general format and it's gonna change depending on you know, how the length or kind of what work you did, but that is kind of the general sequence that you should follow and that readers are expecting to see when they're looking at a resume or, or sorry, a resume or an abstract. So that's kind of just like the template. Um, and uh, like I mentioned kind of briefly in the intro, where do uh, abstracts appear? Um, so as part of your thesis requirements, you need to write one for, and this includes your memoir. So we have on our website, uh, a guide for grad students on how to prepare their thesis proposal and their um, thesis, final thesis or memoir document. Those have been posted uh, on the Department of Communication kind of website. I, I think they're, Jen might be able to help me or perhaps Fred, est-ce que tu sais où c'est affiché le guide? Uh, je pense sur la, le site de la faculté. Okay. Um, there's a link there, the faculty website. So. Yeah, but yeah. Not, not I can take it up, Meredith, and share it in the chat also. Um, okay, perfect. Yeah, so we recently updated that guide for communication students, and it's for the master's thesis. We're still in the process of building the PhD one, um, but this is a good guideline to look at in terms of kind of the components of what should be in it. Um, but what's interesting about the abstract is that is the little summary that's going to appear in the University of Ottawa uh, library website. So when people search your thesis kind of for the rest of time, the little blurb that's going to come up with it is your abstract. So again, this isn't something that you should just kind of leave to the last minute because it's probably the only thing most people are going to read. So just keep that in mind. Um, and uh, like I said, yeah, our, our guide 
or our thesis writing guide uh, includes some extra information about the thesis abstract if you'd like to see more there. Um, ensuite, uh, comme j'ai mentionné, uh, on utilise souvent un résumé pour faire demande uh, à une conférence et c'est souvent cette résumé là qui apparaît dans le programme du conférence. Et il y a même certaines conférences qui publient officiellement tous les résumés et ça compte comme une publication, c'est so like a published abstract. Et uh, ça, c'est disponible en ligne pour comme tout le monde. And you can see that those, uh, those sometimes get cited. So sorry, that one I'll repeat in both languages. So when you uh, apply for conferences, you need to write a, a short abstract to describing your work. That will usually appear officially in the conference program. And some um, organizations actually publish all of those and put them uh, in, in a special edition of a journal. And people can cite those and read those. So another reason to make sure that you don't do this at the last minute or it doesn't have something silly in it. Um, and then finally, um, at the start of any uh, publication uh, or book chapter, uh, there's usually a short summary at the beginning. Um, an interesting thing about abstracts for pub peer reviewed publications is they are the only thing that are not behind a paywall. So if uh, someone trying to access your work doesn't have library access, they'll still be able to see the abstract uh, for free, even if they cannot access uh, the rest of it. So I know that um, Jennifer and the Student Association are trying to start some kind of ways to make our research more accessible kind of to the lay person. Uh, there's going to be lots of exciting things coming. But for now, if you publish something in a peer reviewed journal and kind of want to send it to your friends and family, they're probably only going to be able to see the abstract. So um, I know personally, I get a lot of inquiries from people who are at smaller universities, sometimes asking for my paper, copies of my papers so they can read them because they like the abstract. So that's a, another way to use that. Uh, euh, je ne sais pas, Fred, si tu as quelque chose à ajouter? Euh, non, ça m'apparaît assez clair. Donc, euh, c'est vraiment une, une bonne explication là, des manières de, de voir l'abstract comme un, un « useful tool hein, ». C'est vraiment un outil pratique qui peut servir. Euh, donc, ce n'est pas simplement pour résumer votre article, ou votre papier ou votre chapitre. C'est vraiment un outil qui peut vous permettre une diffusion et une visibilité. Even better. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, so I already kind of highlighted this, but if you didn't already get this message, why are these important? It's because it literally might be the only thing people read. So you're going to spend hours and hours and hours and hours doing all this research and creating this huge document. And most people are going to be too lazy or just not have the time to read all of it. And they are going to read 150 to 300 words. And you want to make sure that that has uh, impact and it's good. So that is that. Um, so, like I said a uh, little bit, you know, we use them to uh, help others or other people use them to read your work and de decide if they want to attend a presentation you're giving. Um, you use this to communicate with people who don't already have time to read the entire document. Um, and ultimately, a weak or poor abstract is going to result in weak or poor engagement. So, um, It just in the group here, who has been to an academic conference so far? Okay, so the way it usually works is there's multiple sessions going on at the same time. So you would look at the program and you'd see, okay, there's this, at, you know, at 9 a.m. I can go to this session or this session or this session. And all you have is the abstract. So oh, this actually translates into whether people show up for your talk or not, because there's competing things going on. So if yours sounds like vague or doesn't make sense, then people will probably, unless they're really inherently interested in your topic or they know you, they're probably not going to come. So another uh, good strategy is to, you know, make it very clear and the contribution, like, very explicit. Um, if, if I may add something we, about, about yeah. that. Um, well, you still also need to be careful because, of course, you want the people to come to your presentation at conference. So you might put a little extra uh, uh, into your abstract, right? And then pretend that you're doing many things that you will uh, only do in your head. And then your research does not do that. So once people are there, 100 people at your conference, uh, they might also be disappointed. So um, yeah, there's that, you know, 
a pitfall yeah. when you can just put a little bit too much because you want, you know, you're proud of your research and at the end, well, you still have to stick with the data and what you really do. So that's a, that's a great reminder not to like, not to inflate your results or reach beyond your methods of what you've no. done. So that's it. perfect. Thank you for reminding me that I was off floating in the excitement. Yes, Jen. Well, I was going to add, and I'm not sure if this is the case for all conferences, but some of them allow you to update your abstract uh, closer to the publication of the program. So I've um, submitted for a couple conferences, for example, uh, with a preliminary abstract and then and they don't all do this, um, but some of them do offer you the opportunity to update it. Um, so I'm wondering if there would be a recommendation um, perhaps to reach out to conference organizers if your research does change rather than wait to see if that's the case. Yeah, um, I've never seen that, Fred, have you? No, I don't. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's worth asking, um, depending on the size of the conference, that might be seen as like a really big annoyance, but uh, you wouldn't be inter like mm. the person you would send that message to would be the general contact and they're, they're expected to get questions about um, the conference and sit whole process. So it wouldn't, I don't think it would be an unfair question to ask and you might get the answer that yes, they're doing it if they haven't, um, made that explicitly clear. So I, I'd say there's no harm in asking, but I've personally never seen that offered. So that I would be a bit surprised about that, but that's a good point. Um, so any other questions so far? Okay, all right. Um, so I'll present kind of two general formats and then I'll let Fred uh, take over on kind of how, what should go in each section and how to put it together. So it's, if you're presenting the results of a study or like an actual research project, the general format is pretty much always introduction, methods, results, discussions, which follow the general components of what your paper looks like anyway, if you're doing research. Um, and so uh, there might be kind of specific instructions on what type of things they wanna see in each of those sections and they might be structured or not. And I'll, I'll show you that in a second. Um, but that's kind of the general format uh, and you can expect to see, they might change the headings a little bit, but generally it's going to be those four sections. Um, if you're doing something a little bit more kind of theoretical in nature, so I, I feel like Liam, this would touch more kind of in your field uh, where you don't necessarily have kind of a research product that you've created or like an actual research you've done, but instead it's more of like a theoretical review. Um, that one will change a little bit and you would wanna see kind of the context the research is in, what research questions you're doing, uh, kind of the overall objective of this, as well as a kind of summary of the, like what you actually reviewed and then the conclusions and significance. Um, so the sections that we're gonna go over today kind of in more detail touch upon the first example, um, but you can see lots of examples online if you look up the critical review to see, um, what those abstracts should look like. And they're very similar and they still follow that same template. Um, but today we're just gonna go more in detail on the one uh, that touches upon uh, an actual uh, study. So there's that. Um, so I just mentioned that they can be structured or non-structured and this will be kind of in the instructions. So on the left, uh, j'ai un exemple d'un format structuré où on voit les sous-titres introduction, ensuite tu vas écrire une ou deux phrases sans introduction, méthode, une ou deux phrases, méthode, résultat, etc., discussion, etc. Um, et dans ce cas-là, ils s'attendent voir les sous-titres et comme les phrases juste à côté and um, les, les, les sous-titres comptent dans votre limite de mots. So like that's a structured abstract or strict from a structure. Du côté non structuré, on inclut toutes les mêmes informations, mais on a juste pas les sous-titres. Okay, so c'est important de vérifier si une conférence ou un une périodique préfère une version ou un autre. S'il n'y a pas d'instructions, vous pouvez choisir. Personnellement, j'aime la for le format structuré parce que ça m'assure que j'ai toutes les composantes et je trouve que tu peux être plus euh, précis et concis dans ton écriture parce que tu n'as pas à écrire des phrases comme pour transitionner, mais it's personal preference. So, 
Um, just check if when you are writing an abstract, which format they want. And if they don't specify, you can pick. Um, and I was just saying my personal preference is the structured format, um, just because then you don't have to put any fluff in it. You can just answer the questions. Uh, but uh, it's personal preference. Fred, uh, Fred as tu quelque chose à ajouter ou? Uh, non, ça va. Moi, ma préférence, c'est pour le format non structuré. <laughs> um, donc, uh, ça va. C'est chacun uh, sa manière de, de l'aborder. Uh, but either way, uh, you have to put these things in. So, if it's structured or not, it's, you have to have the information. Exactly. Okay. So, another thing to check when uh, you are applying anywhere, so whether it's a conference, whether it's to write your thesis, whether it's to do a publication, is check the specific guidelines uh, for their uh, resumes or resumes, their resume abstracts. Um, the number of times I've had a journal article come back rejected from the editor only have to like resubmit it again because I didn't follow their abstract guidelines is, is too many. I'm embarrassed. So uh, please actually check. Uh, that'll tell you how many words um, and whether there's a format and if it's structured, which headings they want. Um, so usually uh, the guidelines will specify something between 150 to 300 words. Obviously, if it's 150 words, you're going to be very focused and just providing kind of the bare essential information to correspond to those four sections. If you have 300 words, you can actually elaborate a little bit. So um, there is kind of some flexibility if it's a bit longer. I'd say, um, Eliza, for intercom, do we have a, 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 a rule or? Um, no, at this time oh. we don't. Maybe <laughs> as we get closer, uh, we can create one to, before we post them on the website. But for now, we're just accepting um, just a few lines. OK. So, so intercom is still a baby conference. We'll say it's like a little child. So as it grows, we'll get uh, more kind of specific guidelines, but expect for any other conferences that it's going to be a pretty rigorous um, description of what you should be submitting. Um, okay. All right. So I'll pass it off to Fred. I guess je peux contrôler, contrôler le PowerPoint. So qui va vous parler un peu des différentes sections et des points uh, considérés pour chaque section. Mm -hmm. Alors, euh, dans la partie introduction, donc je vais y aller en français et en anglais, donc peut-être qu'il y a des gens qui ne euh, comprennent pas le français, peut-être que je ferais mieux d'y aller en anglais euh, 100%, là, donc je ne sais pas. Euh, uh, but I'll do it in English because it's easier for, I guess, everyone. So, um, so the introduction, um, well, the purpose or, or, or the problem or the practical or theoretical problem. So, you know, what's that all about? Right? So that's the question that you can ask yourself if this paper or this um, text is about what exactly? So you want to make sure to answer that first. And then either or go straight up with the question uh, you aim to answer. Uh, it's not always obvious that you would put the, the, the research question into an abstract. So um, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily do that. I would really make sure that what's the purpose, what's the aim, and the famous question of what, you know, what, what's that article or paper or chapter about. Uh, so make sure that it's quite clear and sometimes one sentence, uh, if you can put it into one sentence, that's pretty fine. And you can add another sentence to put things into context, but you know, you have to have one, one sen sentence that um, talks about the uh, problematic, uh, practical or theoretical problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can add, Meredith, if you want to add things or, you know, comments. Oh, yeah, just, so sorry, the or research question is like to help guide you if you want. But Fred's right, you wouldn't explicitly state it, right? So it's more kind of just to help kind of guide the purpose. So if you're using your research question helps you better phrase that or frame that, then that might help you get really to the point about, you know, what is the purpose of this? Yeah. So and once you did that, you want to somehow translate into your own research or you, this is the problem, this is the context. So this is how I will tackle it. Uh, this is how I will investigate or test or analyze or evaluate. So you want to translate that into your research. So that's the shift somehow into what readers will uh, know about. So it's quite interesting to pass from problematic context and then, all right, so this is it. This is what I'll do um, a bit more specifically. Um, so again, that, that switch 
or that shift or that traduction is quite uh, important to do uh, because this is where people will be able to know uh, where we're going with that, right? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the question of uh, present or past uh, or, or well, you want to put it into uh, the present definitely, not in the future because it's a summary of a research that you already did, right? Um, so it's something that you want to make sure that it's this is it or this is what we did um, as uh, a research show. Make sure that you, you know that. I, well, maybe um, we specify that because sometimes in a few conferences, you do write the abstract without completing the whole research, right? Um, so you might be tempted to say, well, we will do this and we will you know complete the interviews and so it's a bit of a tricky one but only in the case where you uh, submit an abstract for a conference and they will ask you for the full paper like six months later so but most conferences or abstract for a paper or for um, a book chapter you will your, your research will be done already so it's not that of a problem uh, mm -hmm. but it's something you might um, find sometimes a, 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 a pitfall or something that you um, might do, uh, but it's not a thing that you want to do, Pre present or past, definitely. Um, yeah. Yeah, Meredith, you want to? Um, just to add, uh, so I think a common error for a lot of people where they struggle is to, you get really hung up on wanting to contextualize the research. And instead of only spending like one sentence on what is the problem and why I'm here, you get kind of in this trap where you want to provide a really detailed literature review in order to kind of justify why you did your study. Um, but all you're doing is taking up your word count to talk about other people's research mm. instead of providing kind of the most clear way to like, okay, this is a problematic. This is what my goal was. This is how I addressed it and like or right into it because if if you spend too much time summarizing other stuff, what ends up happening is, and this is very common, is your abstract is basically a res like a summary of other people's work and then like half a sentence about what you did. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to keep this like as succinct and tight as possible um, so that you're not uh, dwelling kind of like you're just not wasting people's or your very valuable space on work that is basically not your own. So um, yeah. Okay, any questions about the introduction? Yeah, it, might, it, might, or... it might seem a bit like too complex for nothing somehow, but you have to go straight at it and going straight at it, it's not that easy. Uh, no. you, you tend to, as, as the illustration, the weak and the strong, we tend to go, this study will and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, this study investigates it's a bit of a you know straightforward and then again it's not that obvious to go straight at it so that, that yeah. maybe that's the takeaway message uh, and so yeah that's a great point and i think some of you in the grant writing workshop some of the feedback i gave you was that to be more direct in what you were going to do like instead of like dancing around it but just use direct language um there it's a it is a word game and yeah fred's right like jump in as much as you feel like you need to kind of like stick your toe in and warm people up, like don't do it. Go right for the kind of key important parts. Okay. Um, if there's no questions about intro, we can move on. Well, yeah, the, with the method, and again, Meredith, if you want to um, say a few things also. Uh, same thing here. Um, you don't want to expand too much on the method, to be honest. Um, not that it's boring. Um, but you want to go, you know, you, the problem is there, you, 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 you'll, you're telling everyone how you will address that problem. And, you know, we soon want to go with the results and, you know, the stuff that will happen. So method, it's a bit of a, you know, a detour, but again, people who really love method and I do. And so the point is that, you know, say what you did, basically how you proceed to get the data and then move on. Um, and because the method is just to make sure that your research has been done well, um, and it, unless it's a methodological paper, I'm, I'm just saying uh, either an empirical or conceptual paper, but uh, uh, in that case, the method um, really 
as, as it says, don't critique, just say, you know, that's what we did, the overall, or you can also go uh, with the, either you're going with the quantitative, qualitative, uh, and then um, you can go as far as, as the interviews. And then I, I would not necessarily talk about the interviews and the participant. I think it's you just go with the either qualitative, quantitative, um, something uh, ethnographic study, um, questionnaire or questionnaire. Or, so yeah, I would really go just to give an overall picture of what you did to get the data. Mm -hmm. Uh, J'ai une question, mais peut-être, um, comme je suis trop avancée dans votre présentation, um, comment est-ce qu'on décide quelle partie du résumé est le plus important? Est-ce que ça, ça change dépendant du destination? Comme par exemple, um, une conférence plus méthodologique ou un, un journal plus méthodologique um, au lieu qu'un qu un autre, un autre destination? Oui, mais si c'est une conférence méthodologique, ta problématique, elle va être avoir être axé sur la méthodologie, donc ça ne sera pas dans la section méthode, right? So if, if you address a method problem, this will become your problem. Okay, so then it's less about the destination of the abstract and more about the, the project itself. If you've, um, I, I remember a couple of years ago in the PhD seminar, Martin, uh, Martin or, or Roxana, that one of them had a, a professor come in to speak or a guest speaker who had kind of pioneered this new ish methodology um, and so that to me seemed to be like the important contribution was that rather than the results necessarily so but actually the contribution was the result okay so I yeah, see, I, yeah you go, go for it no no i just i just exactly what fred was saying like the the need to justify why she needed to take that approach would have come up in the problematic so she would have already been talking about the need for this new or the applications of this new um, approach. And then her methods would have described briefly kind of like, you know, how it was used and then really in the results and discussion kind of expanded on that. So if, if, it, if the contribution is the methods, then it, it shows up everywhere. Okay. Does that, I think I, I took Fred's words basically, sorry. <laughs> so. And oh, that was a good question. Yeah, Sorry. is there a new question? Yeah. No. Oh, sorry, I asked the same question in the chat yeah. as well. Oh, yeah. Well, you have to figure out yourself. And of course, if you have a, a conference on method, yeah, the, the, the method part of the abstract, you will talk about how you proceed to talk about method, right? Uh, as as Meredith said, so you, obviously you need to know where you're sending the abstract. But I think here we're talking about the general format of how we can proceed to uh, build an, an interesting and strong abstract. But you mm -hmm. have to adapt to where you send it. Mm -hmm. And that's and actually just on that note, sometimes kind of related, and a conference might ask for an additional section where they say like, what is the application of this? what are the, you know, like they might ask an extra section kind of for something very specific. Um, so I didn't include those examples here, but that that might be somewhere else if it was a methods conference where they might say, okay, like what, how, you know, please add at the end, like how this can be used in other research or how, you know, like something that's like kind of tangible. So that might also be a requirement too, um, but wouldn't be again, part of the kind of like general format, more like a bonus section, so. Okay. Uh, it's no HTC, you will be... All right. So the next section. So the, finally, the result. So um, this is quite uh, important, uh, definitely, but it has also to be part of what you uh, wrote before, right? So if you come up with these, you know, amazing results, and then, you know, they're a bit like, you know, too much for what you presented before and they're not linked to the problematic and they're not linked to the method, uh, there's going to be a problem. So of course, this is really important, but you have to really think about you know, what you put in there uh, in accordance to what you uh, wrote before. So that's maybe something you want to have in mind. Um, and um, well, you want to also keep in the results um, 
a little bit of a, not a mystery, uh, but you want to say, well, you know, this is going to be really interesting for you to read, right? So you want to give a little bit of the actual result, but you don't want to go too far, I guess. So I, I don't have a proper answer to that, maybe merit or other people, but you have to give some of the results, but you have also to keep a little bit uh, for the paper. Um, so it, it's a bit of a, an in-between posture, uh, but I kind of like to say, yes, you know, you will see this and that, and but, you know, go at page, you know, 15, 20 to, to really dig into that. So it's, it's a bit of a, a giving the big picture again, uh, maybe ends of what they will read. And then you can say, well, that's it for, you know, for the abstract. So maybe, Mary, do you want to add something to that. Yeah, um, I guess kind of the main thing, and this will be especially applicable to your thesis, uh, but there's no way you're going to be able to summarize everything in two or three sentences anyway, right? And like exactly kind of what Fred's saying, like it's going to end up serving as kind of like a teaser or a highlight. Um, you want to put maybe kind of your main finding or, you know, but I think the kind of most important thing that um, I think Fred just touched upon, and it, it's not explicitly written in the slides, um, is the idea that these results need to match whatever research question or problematic you already highlighted. So um, for example, you know, if you said that this is a research on, or a project on, I don't know, Canadian media, and then your results are talking about, I don't know, media in Europe, like that, that's a problem that there's a, there's a disconnect there between what you said the problem was, what you said your research proposal or research uh, question was and how you're going to address it. Uh, what your methods were and what the results were. So it needs to be coherent, using the same language, using the same, if you're using variables, using those same variables, not changing the names of things. Because with so few words, you don't have time to keep defining things. So I think it's, it's this is like a really good reminder that the results need to match what you've already introduced. And if, you know, there were changes between what you plan to do and what you actually found, I depend, it would, I don't know. What do you think? Would that fit? Like if, if let's say you were hoping to find X and you found something completely different, I think that that would be more in the paper and you would frame your uh, abstract around what you actually found. Because yeah. there just isn't space to go through that kind of mm -hmm. change of thought process or, you know, unexpected results in the abstract. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Any other questions here? All right. Okay, and the final section. Uh, yeah, conclusion. Um, well, conclusion also is a bit less clear what you can put in there. Um, you can either open up the discussion somehow, you can either put things into context one, once more, um, or you can repeat and rephrase the result uh, in, in another way. So the conclusion, um, I find it always quite difficult uh, for an abstract to, to because if this is your you know the, the last sentence that you will put and so I'm always a bit uh, you know uh, puzzled by how to you know finish the, these things. Um, but as as it's, it's, it says there, you have a, the reader should have a clear understanding of the central point that your research has uh, proved or argued. So that's why I, I said you might want to go either you know go back to what what's what's that all about or go back to these results are really, really contributing to that field uh, or yeah. So yeah, I think you wanna put the emphasis or either repeat or rephrase somehow, either the results, the how you tackled it or how you contribute to the field. Yeah. And I think this is a good point where it would be a good idea if you're submitting um, to kind of a, a journal or a conference to really tie in the purpose of the conference or that journal's mm -hmm. aims into your discussion. So like if it's an applied conference, then you should probably have some sort of applied recommendation or kind of application of your research in that mm -hmm. kind of final sentence. If it's a theoretical conference and kind of what it like, so tie it in kind of the bigger picture and the audience that is going to be reading it. Um, journals have, uh, when you, if you, once you start submitting your stuff for publication in journals, they clearly outline the aims and scope of their, uh, their particular publication. So it might say like, oh, you know, we're an applied journal or we're, you know, we 
and you can kind of see what like they're hoping to have and what kind of things fit and you should probably frame that conclusion kind of within what they're targeting for their kind of broader audience. So sorry, that was a really long winded way to say read the aims and scopes of the uh, journals or publications that you're submitting to. Um, I don't know anything to add to that Fred. All good. Yeah. Jen, you had a question? Yes. Uh, I just, I was kind of wanted to come back to that if that's okay. Um, because something that jumped out at me when you were speaking about that is using the language um, that the journal would use in their call for papers or conferences. They often have like a scope or a theme, um, not all, but some do have a theme that they're focusing on each year. And so one that jumps out is um, the Carleton graduate students often do a conference in February uh, and they usually have a theme. It's a two day conference. It's fairly large. They've been doing it for about 17 years now, I think. Oh, wow. um, and last year their theme was beyond borders. And then in their call for papers or call for presentations, they kind of explained what they meant by beyond borders. And so when I submitted um, my presentation idea to them, I made sure to use the word beyond in there and um, mm -hmm. I touched on some of their themes I think they spoke about interdisciplinarity so I made sure to use and to talk about how my presentation brought together different disciplines um, and I find I've had a lot of success doing that um, I think it makes it easier for the conference evaluators um, to pick things when it's clear how it relates mm -hmm. to their to their theme yeah I think that's I think that's great advice um, yeah, I guess the only and then the only thing the only caveat I put on that is that please don't like like adjusting your research so that it kind of pivots to fit kind of in a general area and like just adjusting your language slightly not a problem completely changing what you did to like fit the mold of something else avoid that uh, that 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 would be um, kind of like what Fred was saying at the beginning, how it'd be kind of expanding beyond the results of what you did or really kind of taking too big of a leap from your work to what its contribution is. So just make sure that in kind of adapting your kind of communication and discussion to the audience that's going to be reading it, just make sure that you're not fabricating anything, I guess, is a good reminder. Okay, um, I think we had another slide on this. Oh yeah, part two. I think that you got that, I guess. Um, yeah. the, the present tense and the fact that you have to go straight at it. So, um, nah, it's pretty... yeah. So this is a point, if you wanted to, you could comment, comment about the limitation of your study, cause that would interpret, or that would have an influence potentially on the way your results are interpreted. So if you think that that's relevant, like, uh, I don't know, for example, um, like maybe I'll, I'll use Woody Yam's work, for example, let's say he, he's reviewing a number of plays that were published during a certain period of time. You know, if he hasn't mentioned in the methods that that it's this time frame around what he's studying, then he should probably mention that in the in the conclusion so that people have that context of knowing, OK, this is kind of this study was specifically done kind of on this time frame. So either that needs to be in the methods kind of as the inclusion criteria or mentioned in the discussion as a way for framing how the results should be interpreted. Um, if if there is something kind of like that, I'm not sure. William, you could probably explain your research a bit. Like, did I get it like the years right? Like, uh, oui, uh, oui, oui, effectivement, mon session travaille sur des, 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 des œuvres qui ont été faites après 2000, fait que tout ce qui a été fait avant ça, Les, les, les résultats de ma recherche ne seront pas applicables, euh, surtout d'un point de vue théorique. Je me réfère à un concept qui est apparu en 2010. Donc, euh, c'est sûr que ça devient plus difficile d'extrapoler de, de, ces résultats-là pour yeah. des événements so, qui ont eu lieu avant. Perfect. Mm -hmm. OK, so that, that would be a perfect example of some sort of kind of limitation or kind of parameter around your work that you would want to make sure is included in the abstract somewhere. It doesn't need to be a big thing, just, you know, just so people know. Uh, Fred, do you have anything to add? No, but most of the time I don't put the limits or, you know, the, the, the things that you, know, you didn't do or you wanted to do. It's about what you did. 
but as William said, these um, contextual um, um, things that you want to put, uh, saying that you did your research between this and that, it might be either in the problematic or in the in the method. So. Um, yeah, you can put limits definitely, but I at, at that point I don't have no more space. So yeah, <laughs> I'll just keep it out. As une question, William? Ouais, j'aurais. Ben, en fait, si je me demande, j'imagine que ces genres d'éléments contextuels là, dans la mesure où justement on mentionne dans la problématique puis dans nos méthodes sur quoi on travaille puis par rapport à quel time frame, les gens ils, en lisant ça ils, ils en viennent à être conscient un petit peu des, des limites inhérentes de la recherche sans qu'on ait besoin de dire, ben voici des limites. Yeah. Mais, ça, en, and I think, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Ben, en fait, pas, je pense pas que ce soit une limite le fait que tu t'intéresses tu à une période. C'est simplement un choix méthodologique puis d'objet de recherche. C'est pas la même chose qu'une limite d'une recherche. Non, c'est clair. Mais dans le sens, ouais, effectivement. C'est juste au niveau de la transposabilité des résultats. Après, les gens, ils sont conscients que, comme je travaille sur ce contexte-là précis, c'est sûr que. Mais la transposabilité, des cas, elle ne se, se pose pas à toutes les recherches non plus. C'est pas une question mm -hmm. qu'on se pose automatiquement. Comme exact. Mes recherches à moi, moi, je ne me pose jamais cette question-là. Je ne la pose pas en limite non plus. Je ne la pose pas du tout. Euh, Quelqu'un pourrait me demander dans une conférence Ah, oh, est-ce qu'on peut transposer? Je vais dire euh, non. Mais dans l'abstract, je pense que c'est moins la place de partir dans des considérations euh, comme ça, mais c'est vrai que s'il reste une phrase ou s'il reste un espace, on peut parler des limites. Why not? Yeah. It's more, yeah, it's there as an if. C'est plus comme dans les cas, like let's say for example, you did a study on undergraduate students and you were looking at kind of social media use in the classroom, you know, you might want to say like, oh, and this was, it ended up, you know, it was in the virtual classroom only, or it was um, only women participated or something. Like these are the kind of limits that might, aren't necessarily kind of instrumental to what you were trying to do or your research, um, but could impact potentially how your research was interpreted. I don't know, you were doing your research and in the middle of it, a global pandemic happened. So like, who knows how that it's hard you know like something just a little sentence if it fits but fred's right it's not necessary it doesn't always have to be there and it's literally only if you have space and if you think you know it's more uh just things that could appear in the conclusion so okay any other questions here these are good questions <laughs> no okay all right um and then okay so just just in case this came up a if you don't have results yet uh, you can actually write an abstract of your proposal and you have to write one as part of your formal thesis proposal. Um, so what that would include instead is still the same sort of introduction. You would talk about your planned methods, your planned analysis, and that, that wouldn't be very detailed. It would be just a very short sentence and your expected or anticipated contributions or findings. So in that case, um, the verb tense would change. You would still have um, the introduction in the present, but then all of the other ones would be written in the future tense. So these, this is what you can expect uh, for your thesis proposal. As-tu des choses à ajouter à ça, Fred? Um, yes, for the thesis proposal, um, would that be the 20 page like uh, document? We. Oui. Yeah, so I guess it's a bit of another, you know, format. So um, I don't want people to be confused about that because uh, it's a bit of a, it's not the same as a formal abstract for a paper. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I think you can go further than only the planned method because you might know already the methods even though you don't have the result, right? Mm -hmm. um, as the analysis, well, that part won't probably be in your abstract and anticipated contribution well you might might be at the end in the conclusion so um yeah i think it, it's something we can you know talk about but uh, it's yeah so it's a bit different uh, it's very, yeah. for a thesis because you you cannot you can have like quite a lit review you can you know the method can be quite strong already contextualized uh, or introduction 
I can be, you know, all there almost, right? Um, so, um, and then, you know, the result or what you will find or the data um, is something that you will, uh, it will be based on what you propose. But so again, I just want to make sure that, you know, sometimes the proposal, and I do read a lot and I do supervise uh, quite a few students and, you know, the proposal is quite strong and you have like many, many insights on what, you know, the results might be, but the method is there, you know, the context is there and uh, so, yeah. Because it, it seems that it might be a little bit like, you know, um, I intend to do this and that, but I, I for the, for a proposal for a PhD or a master proposal, I, I think you can already have like a bit more straightforward with the method definitely and with the lit review. So um, kind of just to jump on this, and I'm not sure if you guys have seen them, but there are some conferences that accept proposals uh, for, and I know Fred talked about this, that you can talk about work that maybe at the time that you apply for the conference, you haven't done the work yet, but there are also conferences that let you talk about planned work as your presentation. Um, so in those cases, you might need an app, a conference like this, but this is more just as like an FYI for all of you guys, if you're looking to get kind of research experience and presentation experience, you can look and see if conferences accept proposals. And then you could present your thesis proposal at a conference if you mm. wanted to and talk about your planned work. And that would get you an extra mm. line on your CV, an extra way to network, um, also get some kind of early feedback on what you're planning on doing. So some conferences are very open to getting presentations like this because it's a good way to do science, right? To let more people in on like, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? So it's like actually a great way to get feedback on your planned work. Um, but also a great way as a grad student to add a line to your CV. So um, yes, Jeremy, you're gonna say something? Um, I was gonna say that I often use graduate student conferences to do that. And then um, the, like, like, um, the full conference later um, as well presents some finished research. So there's graduate student conferences um, like ours, like the Carleton one that I mentioned. And then many associations also have a graduate student chapter or division, um, and they'll have their own kind of conference series running at the same time as like the larger one. Um, so I'm a member of the Popular Culture Association, PCA down in the States. They have their full multi-day conference with multiple panels running from different chapters or segments. And some of those chapters or segments include grad student conferences or grad student presentations. Um, so I try to target my, my abstracts accordingly. Perfect. But it's just a tip, it's not. Yeah. You know, a guy. No, that is, do absolutely this. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so any questions about that? Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe it'd be cool if we, we could start. Do we have a list going of like student conferences other than our own? Uh, we're working on that on the website. So the CGSA okay. does have a page for conferences, um, but it requires submissions and curations um, because comms is so interdisciplinary. Uh, so I've, for example, started filling in popular culture stuff because that's my area of expertise. But if anyone on this uh, in this meeting or watching this video has any sources or suggestions that you would like added, um, it's, it's a repository that's going to keep growing uh, over the years. Perfect. That's great. Okay. Um, okay. All right. I guess, uh, Fred, do you want to take the first few common mistakes? <laughs> so we've touched on some of these, but this is just kind of a in one stop, one stop, everything. Uh, right here. So. Alors, ça, le Gizmi fournit une de ce que l'article pose comme problème ou expliquera plutôt que ce qu'il a trouvé. Um, yeah. Um, I guess it's quite explicit, uh, the, that problem. Um, um, what can I say uh, more? Well, again, you have to talk about what you found and what are your results and the data. Um, we cannot stress that anymore um, because it's, it's always easy somehow to open, you know, the, the door to many problems or problematic. Uh, and the context become in, in, in your abstract, the research, um, which is not the same. So uh, as Meredith said, you, you might want to put a sentence for the contents and then you, uh, for the context, and then you put another one and then you put another one. And at the end, you're just talking about the context and not the result. So this is something that you will do. And I probably do that 
you know, a lot. I think we all do it. It's, no. it's hard not to. <laughs> no. Yeah, so same, same, basically same comment. Um, no. Background information is too long. Yeah, this one, I'll be interested on Fred's opinion on this. So mm -hmm. most abstracts say no citations, mm -hmm. but some people still do it and some places no. want it. So this is, yeah. I, actually, it's interesting because I, I did, uh, there's a few illustration in, in the coming slides that I did, you know, um, took um, abstract from my own work because I had no time and sorry, I didn't want to, you know, cite my work or stuff because I had, you know, yeah. really um, uh, rushed morning. Anyway, just to say that in one of the abstract and it's for a book chapter, we do cite um, uh, some authors. And then so, but most of the time I don't do that. So I, I felt like maybe that's a problem and maybe we can critique that and I, that, that's just fine. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's normally we don't, but again, you know, if you feel that it's really important, if you are criticizing or talking about Foucault's work or someone who's really important in the field, well, maybe that's important to put that into your abstract because you have fans of Foucault who really wants to work, you know, read your work, your work. So you might say, well, maybe I'll put that into the abstract and all the people that I want to talk to, which would be fans of Foucault or whatever other, uh, uh, famous uh, philosopher. Well, maybe that's a good thing to, to put that uh, and to cite some of his work. So, but normally we don't do, but in, in, in the illustration, I did. Yeah. And yeah, it might, it's, that's like, I think a great point is that it can happen, but just make sure again, you're not following into the trap of citing too much. Um, yeah. yeah. And then this one was just about the methods. And I think Fred already touched upon this very brief description of your method. So I think a kind of spot where a lot of uh, graduate students make mistakes is they're really excited to talk about the analytical software they use. Like, oh, I, you know, I used SPSS or I used in vivo, like nobody cares about that. So you don't, you don't need to put that that's wasted space in your abstract. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, Fred said it like very bare minimum details of what you did and who the data is about or what you what you actually studied and then move on. <laughs> so that's that. Oh yeah, sorry, I already said that one. So some of these overlap. Mm -hmm. I need to say that I'll, I'll have to leave in about five minutes. I have a yes. meeting at one, so. Yeah, oh wow, it went by fast. Okay, uh, yeah, so just quickly, no acronyms. Uh, please do not present rep, uh, results that are not actually part of whatever you said you were gonna do or don't appear in the paper. Um, and then make sure that your findings aren't too general that anyone reading it would say like, eh, like move on. So kind of target in. Um, and then we'll just quickly go to the examples. So these are Fred's. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was a book chapter, but with colleagues from the department, it was published in 2019, I think. Uh, so I, I decided to, um, took one in French and one in English. So even that, if you write an abstract in French and in English, it's completely different uh, as you, maybe you publish in both languages. So in French, uh, even though it might be a, a myth or stereotype, it's more somehow written or it's more something that is like, you know, with longer sentences somehow. Um, so it's, it's another way to do, but that's another <laughs> uh, talk that we can have. Um, yeah. So in that one, we do cite like two, or, yeah, two papers. And then, so do I want to read that like, like all the way? Um, well, I don't want to read that, but that one thing that we didn't talk about is the title and the mochli, the keywords. So we, oui. um, this is so, so quite important. The title, it's really linked to the abstract. So if you have a boring title or something that it's, you know, you cannot like, you know, you don't even understand or it's, it's not appealing, it will affect your abstract because, you know, before reading the abstract, people will read the title, but maybe that's a bit of a, you know, a, that's not the point of, of that, but I felt like it was interesting to, to say that. Um, and then the Mokli, the keywords also quite, quite important and not always obvious. Uh, to find. Um, so yeah, um, the example, so, you can read it. I, I don't want to read it out loud about, about the, except the fact that we did quote 
uh, and then normally we don't, but we felt like we wanted that work to be part of that bigger picture of that uh, conversation. So I think I think the distinction here is that that this work was key and essential to the convert to the work that Fred was doing, and yeah. not kind of like the whole body of re like trying to build the argument for the problematic. Like it's two; those are kind of distinct things. I'm not sure if you can see the difference, but it's kind of justifying with citations why there's a problem versus exactly. the problem or the kind of framework being related specifically to a body of work. Exactly. Those are different, and I would argue that what Fred needed here to cite that was imp was important and essential to kind of understanding the context. But exactly. that if it had been less specific and more broad, you wouldn't need to do that. Mais juste avant, like, since we're, this went by fast, Fred, as tu dis uh, truc pour les mots clés, any advice on this? It's not always requested, but it is a bit of a, a game. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you really need to know in what either sphere of activity or research you are working on. So if you know, the, you know the main work of some of the main authors into that specific object of research or subject, you need to figure out how they frame their own research. And so if there's any words that you know that are quite important to your research, as for me, I really like to put ethnography because I, I really find, you know, the people that I like to read are doing ethnographic stuff. So, and my work is partly that. So I really, most of the time put ethnography because I feel that it's really strong in my work. Um, and so over the years, you will find these keywords also that you want to put uh, the emphasis on. So, um, and then so yeah, it's to make sure that you know to what people you want to talk to and what people matters into your own field or subject matter and what you feel your research is about. Yeah. yeah. And these, these used to have more weight because it's how the library search engine worked. But with Google Scholar, it's going to search your whole abstract, I think. Someone yeah. might be, someone who has a better knowledge of this might be able to correct me. So there's less, there's less like pressure on picking perfect words now. Um, but Fred's right, it can serve as like a good link between you and kind of the broader field. Or if there's, you know, if there's a really nice theory that you like and you kind of want to draw the attention of the authors in it, then using those keywords is, is a really good strategy. Yeah. Um, all right, so it's it's one o'clock. I know some of you need to go, but we'll share these slides so you have the English example as well. And then we just quickly wanted to plug uh, the workshops for after Christmas. So we're starting with uh, how to do conference posters and presentations. So hopefully you can see the link between doing the abstract here if you're applying for intercom. And then in early January, we'll cover how to prepare your presentation or your poster, depending on what you're doing at intercom. So if you're coming. Um, and then in February, we'll talk about building your CV. So that would include uh, web CVs. Uh, so like a, a web kind of based CV if you wanna go into research or industry, as well as kind of the academic CV and the industry CV. Um, in March, we're gonna have SAS coming to talk about work-life balance. And then in April as part of Arts Week, we're gonna look at um, knowledge mobilization. We're looking into something potentially with podcasts and kind of how to set that up. Uh, so that is kind of our agenda for after Christmas. And I know Jen wanted to plug uh, Intercom. <laughs> yes, uh, thanks, Meredith. So I've just shared a link uh, in the chat for Intercom. Uh, Eliza Sylvia, who was on the call uh, until a few minutes ago, um, is our VP academic. Um, so she is responsible for organizing Intercom this year, uh, working with um, a very large team to do so. Um, I'm just sharing my screen. I mentioned that I provided the link uh, in the chat. This is the CGSA website. Alors, sur notre site web, uh, en dessous de, du tab événement, um, on peut changer de langue en français aussi. Um, vous pouvez voir les détails concernant Intercom de cette année. Alors, on a la, la fed pour um, les abstracts, pour les résumés, pour les posters. On va faire des différentes sessions. Um, Eliza aurait de, des informations supplémentaires sur ça en janvier aussi pour ceux et celles qui sont acceptés. Um, je vous encourage de envoyer des résumés pour Intercom. Um, it's essentially a two-day conference. It's going to be taking place uh, January 28th um, and January 29th. Uh, we're going to have different panels running over the course of the day on a variety of communication-related topics. 
Um, and I stress the communication related aspect very strongly. Um, so comms is a very interdisciplinary topic. Um, it touches on many other disciplines and many other disciplines touch on communications. Um, send in your abstract. Um, I'll share the CGSA email uh, in the chat as well. Um, we're not looking for anything super formal. So although we have received some excellent tips and guidance today during this workshop, um, if your abstract isn't quite there yet, um, as, um, um, as was mentioned, we'll work with you to get it up to a standard so that everybody's kind of looks the same in terms of formatting um, so that we can post them on the website. But if you've never done a conference before, I would strongly encourage you to do this one. It is among friends. Um, the criticism that you'll receive, I would uh, prefer to characterize as feedback rather than criticism. So it's not going to be like other academic conferences where someone says they have a question and really it's not a question, it's a comment because you've ignored their entire area of research uh, on, on, an, on, a, on your field or in your field. Um, so health comm, org comm, media studies, popular culture, theater, um, you know, uh, consumer focused stuff, geography, psychology. If there's a tie in with communications, I would encourage you to submit your abstract here. Um, I usually personally use Intercom um, and the Graduate Students Conference that I mentioned at Carleton to kind of practice um, a presentation that I'll be giving at a larger association. So it's a really good opportunity to do that um, and to get feedback in a, in a nice, friendly environment. Um, if you have any questions about that today, I'm happy to answer them. Um, but again, um, it's, it's pretty relaxed and chill as far as conferences go. Um, the deadline for abstracts and poster submissions is January 5th. However, it will be greatly appreciated if you get them in sooner than that, because the sooner we get the abstracts, the sooner we can start to build the presentation panels and the sooner that you'll also know um, when you're presenting, what you're presenting on. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Uh, submit anything uh, was the other thing I wanted to add. So just because you um, might not be ready to do your thesis proposal yet, I am very confident that everyone on this call has, and watching the video has a paper that they've written for one of their graduate classes. That paper could be your presentation. Um, so don't get hung up on what you don't have. Focus on what you have done instead and present something. I like Thanks. it. Thanks, Jen. <laughs>